Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid it has finally happened. Wait, let me check the mic first. Okay, we're good, we're good. <laughs> we have, at long last, come to an inexorable truth. This terrifying thing is something that I have been dreading ever since I determined that I was going to do these ruminations, many years ago, actually, um, on TNG. And that is the final determination of whether or not I actually like Catherine Pulaski as a character or not. She's good in this episode. <laughs> like, she has irritated me several times up until now. But this episode, this is good stuff. It's an excellent character examination of both her and of Picard with some excellent pseudo-mystery suspense in between. This is good This is stuff. In total contrast to last week's episode, this episode feels like it was put to multiple purposes. I mean, there's the obvious tension and threat and the entertainment of the episode, but this really showcases the dynamic between Picard and Pulaski. In fact, while Gates McFadden and Patrick Stewart have wonderful chemistry together, as we know, they basically never really used that to good purpose henceforth. It's actually a damn shame because, as I'm looking at this episode, they use the dynamic between Picard and Pulaski very well, even though the actor and actress don't really have particularly great chemistry together. It's still well written and it's still well executed. I have another thought about that, but I'm going to save that towards the end. First thing I want to mention, this episode actually had a substantial rewrite. Originally there was going to be a small romance subplot in it, which... Uh... <sighs> <laughs> was basically just there to be a romance subplot. For once, the writing staff agreed with me on this matter and said, okay, no. Like, we have other things to focus on. We're not here to just have a random romance. Can we, can we do something else? And so they said, okay, fine, we'll do something else. So instead, we had, ha we had to bring in a whole new character to fill in the slot of, of the holes of the dialogue that character was saying. What about, what about that one guy? Uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, wait, we haven't given him a name yet. Let's give him a name. Yes, this is the episode in which O'Brien is finally named. <laughs> Can you believe that? Season two, he finally gets a name. He's been here since Encounter at Farpoint. Such a weird development arc if you really look at the O'Brien character across the two series. But anyways, now, <laughs> obviously I think O'Brien is a much better fit for that. But I admit I'm a little biased because it's O'Brien and he's one of my favorite characters in all of Star Trek, so the hell do you want from me? <clears throat> I don't have a lot to actually say about this episode. It's very competent. It's very well executed. Um, but again, I just don't have much to say about it other than praise. It's always kind of that one of those weird problems with my show. This is great. Here's why it's great. It doesn't really take up a lot of time. Now, it's not to say this episode is without its flaws. One thing that really bugs me about this episode is they get the calm. Oh, excuse me. They get the calm and it's like, hey, help, help. He says, Lantry? Lantry? L Lantry? L Lantry? Hey, son! It, it, he spends way too long doing it. He does it like two or three times. Then we cut to commercial, or excuse me, cut to the end of the, the cold open. And then we have the t credits. And then it, it comes back. And the first thing he does is he tries again. It's like, okay, Picard, I think they're not responding at this point in time. And then he asks, okay, where are they? Like, I figured it makes sense for him to make these attempts at communication if they're already on their way there, but they hadn't even figured out where they were yet. <laughs> now, they were really nearby. Rather convenient, if you think about it. I will say, though, definite props to the construction of most of the action, I guess is the word I want to use, of this episode. Because most of it makes sense and treats this medical crisis with the severity that it should be treated. Unlike, oh, I don't know, Naked Now, they don't even beam over. In fact, they flat out refuse to beam over. They never do, which is good. Instead, they try to use, uh, you know, remote control to <laughs> basically hack into the other, to all the IP simultaneously and be able to, you know, use the captain's override to activate the view screen and figure out what the hell's going on. Good stuff. Um, when they treat the, you know, we've got to put the patient in, in the, the super stasis and we've got to put the patient inside the force field, they treat that very seriously. And they take, like, all sorts of precautions. And, it, and Picard and Pulaski both hash out back and forth several times. This is what we're going to have to do. This is what it's going to take. There's a lot of the two budding heads throughout this episode, which is, of course, part of the point, as I mentioned earlier. And then uh, there's, there's a, another little bit later where they mention the, the shuttlecraft. 
credit for sense making. Now, granted, we haven't really done a lot with the shuttlecraft in the entire show up until now, but you can't tell me they don't have shuttlecraft. That was in the original series, after all. So this is actually perfectly sense make. We need an isolated environment to test this thing, and one that can be 100% safe from the rest of the ship. Get it in a shuttle. That makes perfect sense. Once again, credit for competency. Now, it's actually funny. They die of old age, and that's been in Star Trek before. And curing some with the transporters has also been in Star Trek before. Yet they act as though neither has. I sometimes wonder if that was deliberate or if the writers involved legitimately didn't know. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter. I just thought I'd comment on that. Because the point I want to make there is that every episode doesn't have to be something new. It just has to be something good. And I do feel like they use it to good effect in this episode with one really gaping huge flaw, which we'll get to later. <clears throat> the whole episode has a feel of threat and of quiet tension to it. There are several, several scenes which have very quiet music in the background or no music at all, and it works very well. And the, the tones people use when talking about the situation are appropriate. You don't hear a lot of... Rawr! You know... It, there's not a lot of overacting. Instead, it's more the quiet dread kind of acting, right? Like, okay, this is what's happening. There's 20, I forget, 26 people dead on that ship. And yeah, this, this is bad. Everyone treats it as if this is bad. And I know that sounds like a weird thing to comment on. There's a simplicity to it. There's a lot of things that are left unstated, let me put it that way, in this episode and the way they push it forward onto the television screen. And I like that. I'm always a fan of minimalism in general. And their usage of silence, their usage of quiet tones, their usage of discussing the se sequences of events and their competency involved all, to me, makes me feel the genuine tension and helps me to get invested in the mystery of what the hell's going on. Now, I will admit, pretty much the moment they mentioned the super immune systems, even as a kid, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's what did it. The immune systems are attacking the other people. Now, I wasn't completely correct about that, but I was still on the right track of that. But the mystery itself is only like the tertiary part of this thing. The secondary part is, of course, the suspense and tension of how devastating the bee as they mentioned in the episode, think about these kids' lives living in total isolation for the rest of their lives. Like, at best, they might get vidcoms or the occasional beam-downs of supplies, and that's all you get, kids. Bye. Fun life, right? And, of course, that's ignoring the many people who die in the process, including Pulaski, who we probably are supposed to care about at this point in time. And I say that that way... <laughs> Because this is episode 7 of season 2, and Pulaski hasn't been in every episode in a significant f manner. She's been in three uh, prior to this in some relevance, in my opinion. That can be argued. We're not really well established into Pulaski here, which is a shame, because they certainly act like we are. It would be interesting if this was Crusher. Now, let me explain that point for just a moment. Obviously, you know, we, we, the Gates McVadden versus, I don't know the actress's name off the top of my head, you know, the, the Crusher versus Pulaski thing is a debate that's been waging since the 90s, the early 90s, so um, I'm not really interested in solving that debate right now. It is my frank opinion that the writers didn't properly use either character to the extent that they should have been. However, it is also worth noting that they do at least use each character to some extent throughout the series, this episode being a good example of that. So, shrug? <laughs> but the reason I bring up Crusher here is because we know that Crusher is the mother of Wesley, who is also someone who is a long-standing uh, friend and ally of Picard. There is pre-existing character backdrop in there, and she's a character we've seen for over a season. Thus, there would be more investment in this scene if it was Crusher, not Pulaski. The other way you could accomplish this is push this episode to the end of Season 2 so we've had all of Season 2 to get to know Pulaski and now that we, we, the audience, are more invested in this character, now we endanger her life and threaten her. Keep that in the back of your mind, by the way, please. I want to I toss something out. It's just been percolating in my brain while I was watching this episode. We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. <clears throat> so, they put everything in quarantine. Woo. Uh... There's a lot of scenes which I'm just going to race through because it's, again, it's just that competency and threat and good presentation. I like the idea. So, first of all, Pulaski is very obviously based on Bones. 
There's no real shame in that. They do a good job of it. But she is so much an XP of bones, she might as well be a female version of him. Not necessarily a bad thing. But I bring that up because they even brought the beaming thing in. And that's the first thing I want to talk about. To me, as weird as this may sound, I would think there would be more people across Starfleet, across the Federation, across Star Trek, who would be hesitant about beaming. And yet everyone's pretty much universally cool with it, with like three exceptions. I, I can only think of three off the top of my head. I'm sure there's others. But you know, there's Bones, there's Pulaski, and there's Barkley. That's all I can think of. I'm sure there's others, but you get my point. I feel like this is the kind of thing they could have had in the background as just kind of more of a fleshing out the setting, that some people just don't prefer it, or some people don't feel comfortable with it. Let me, let me parallel this to something else to make my point. One of the things that people tend to praise Deep Space Nine about is its world building, the fact that it makes it feel more like a setting that's believable. One of the many re bleh, one of the ways they do that is they use many different ways of what I call brush strokes, where rather than drawing a line, they draw a hundred little lines that p paints a more detailed picture. Now this is a metaphor, obviously, but you get the idea. One of those little lines is the difference between replicated food and cooked food, and one of the presentations and purposes in that is that. It's not, it may or may not taste different. That's up for debate. But it makes perfect sense that some people would just prefer non-replicated food. That's a thing now, for God's sakes. I mean, we don't have replication, but how many people do you know personally, or perhaps you yourself are, that specifically prefers such and such type of food for whatever reason, either because you prefer it, or because it just makes you feel better, or because you have some uh, belief, or, or a political agenda, or maybe because you have some allergies. You know, there's all sorts of different reasons for that kind of a thing. That makes sense, right? Hence, the idea of some people just not being cool with beaming makes sense to me. I kind of wish we had more of that. I mean, they do have shuttlecrafts, right? <sighs> the other thing I want to comment with regards to the Pulaski and Picard thing is that both of them, this is a great example of two people who are sufficiently similar in overall personality and that makes them antagonistic towards each other. This is something I've talked about many times, but the general idea is that some people Tetris perfectly together, right? I usually refer to that as chemistry between two actors or characters. Some people, however, are so completely identical that they just, it just bashes right into each other and they don't fit at all because of their similarities. I mean, we see someone else and it's like, ah, I hate all these personality types that remind me of myself. You know, it's a very common uh, psychological thing. So we have p two people who are very driven, who are very career-minded, who are very ambitious, and who are very, very passionate about what they do. Picard, the commander, and Pulaski, the doctor. And thus we see them butt heads almost the entire episode. It's actually funny. At one point... Uh, Picard says, you know, I, paraphrased, I, Lord knows I appreciate feedback from my crew, but please allow me to finish my sentences once in a while. I didn't actually quite notice, but if you pay attention to the dialogue, I actually rewound a bit to rewatch re some of this. If you pay attention to the dialogue, she does talk over the end of his sentences several times, even after this. She even corrects herself and says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And what I love about it is that it's when she finally acknowledges that and says, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to talk over you, you've made your point, that he allows her to go. Now, his reason for why he allows her to go onto the shuttlecraft is because she was trying to reach him and acquiesce to what he was commanding. The commander said, we can only do this if X, Y, Z. And she said X, Y, Z. But the human... My opinion, the human Picard was more willing to reach her halfway because she had finally started making a demonstrable effort to reach him halfway rather than demanding it of him. That kind of cooperation is the kind of thing that Picard's really big on. And in my experience, those kind of people in real life tend to be big on as well. So that makes perfect sense. Again, it's, it's, it's good character stuff. It's good stuff. Um, I wish we had more of it, you know? Because there's not really another big Pulaski episode of it. It's not really. Not that I can think of. We'll see. Um, so they get the shuttlecraft. And they go out. Whoosh. Um, real quick aside, if I may. I mentioned this would work better at the end of Season 2. I stand by that statement strongly. But what I want to mention in addendum to this. Why... 
uh, actually, I hate to do this. I hate to do this. I'm going to go ahead and actually mention that later. I'm sorry. I hate to talk, talk over myself. Let's just move on. So data shows some concern for Pulaski, and Pulaski is just slightly flustered by it, which is great. Data is literally like, no, I was referring to you, doctor. And she, it's not she's like, oh, well, I, you know, it's not overstated. Again, the actress does a good job. She just kind of loses her words for about a second. It's like, oh, oh uh, I'll, I'll be, I, I knew what I was getting into. I like that. It shows how the dynamic between the two has changed. She's actually very polite and kind to Data this entire episode. Again, I feel like that would have worked better at the end of season two. They built up to this part. I mean, we haven't even had uh, the War Games episode. I forget the name of it, but the one where Pulaski and Data have several scenes together, which feels, uh, I don't know, it feels like it would be better before this episode. I also like how O'Brien is actually there at the meeting. He points out the obvious. They already have filters on these transporters. They've already beamed this person several times. It didn't do jack, so obviously this isn't going to work. Now, <laughs> uh, this is when I have to comment on a few things. This is when I have to say... <sighs> so first of all, the way they do this virus is good stuff. It actually makes a weird degree of sense, the way they present this. Uh, I am not a geneticist myself, but having an extremely passive, amateurish understanding of science and genetics in general, the idea of basically fundamentally altering the core DNA so that when self-replicated, it would self-replicate in an increasingly deleterious effect, makes perfect sense to me. It also makes perfect sense that an overactive immune system would do exactly this kind of thing. Which brings me to the kids. They are telepathic and telekinetic and genetically engineered. This raises an eyebrow on me. Oh, I suppose I should actually do it. There we go. <laughs> now, first of all, they're genetically engineered. Now, it's kind of worth noting that the whole anti-genetic engineering thing wasn't invented yet at this point in time. I know we've seen Khan, but if you pension all the episodes of Star Trek, all the, the works of Star Trek that covered the anti-genetic laws that will, you know, have existed since the, I guess, the 19... No, the 2000s, I guess... Uh, so for centuries at this point, haven't been written yet. They're retconned in. So this episode just doesn't quite fit in continuity, unless you presume one of two things. One, these researchers were incredibly illegal, or two, Section 31. It's, it's actually sad how many times Section 31 neatly explains something that's otherwise contiguously you know, flawed within Star Trek, but let's move on. I am curious what you guys think it is. Legitimate question. If we are to zoom this, this episode as canon, if we don't just hand wave it away as, you know, the, the obvious problems that it is in real life, because that is the real answer. They just hadn't written it yet. If we have to accept this as canon, do you think these researchers were just complete rogues? See, here's the thing. A Starfleet vessel gave them a resupply. That's the part that gives me pause. I would be really easy to assume that these are just scientists who are making their own out in the wild because they refuse to accept that genetic research thing. Given the way the doctor, doctor lady, I forget her name, forgive me, uh, so passionately speaks about this, and, you know, this is going to be the next stage of human evolution, all that crap, and our children are so perfect and amazing, it would make sense that, that, kind of, that that's the kind of person who would say, screw it, I'm leaving the Federation to make my perfect humans. But then why is Starfleet supplying them? Or at the very least, why is Starfleet ferrying the supplies to them? To me, I think the Section 31 perspective makes a little bit more sense. I think that these people were... This is my own headcanon. Forgive me for sharing this, but I know several of you have been sharing yours with me. Thank you for that, by the way. I, I love hearing your guys' ideas. For me, the headcanon here is that these people were basically laughed out of Starfleet. Laughed out of Starfleet Medical. Laughed out of the Federation uh, Corps. And we're like, okay. And then a couple people who were either backed by or pushed by or are actively a part of Section 31, reached out to them and said, why don't we get you a planet way out in the middle of nowhere? We'll arrange for a couple occasional supplies to make sure you guys still are, and you can do whatever. You won't really be Federation citizens at that point, so, I mean, the law won't really apply to you, right? With the intent, well, of the obvious, really, of seeing where they could go with it, of seeing what they could do with it. We know Section 31 has a great deal of skill with genetic engineering, thanks to Deep Space, Mo Deep Space Nine. No spoilers or anything, but some of you know what I'm talking about. So this kind of makes a degree of sense to me, that they're just trying to get another leg up in that particular field of research. And, of course, after everything goes incredibly terrible, um, they probably abandoned this particular field of research. Which brings me to my next point, if I may. 
I love the idea, <laughs> as horrible as this may sound, of, well, okay, let me just ask it as a question. What happened to these kids after this episode? They're never mentioned again. They are telepathic, telekinetic humans. Engineered, genetically crafted humans who can kill other people around them with their immune systems. What happened to these kids, do you think? Because I can think of a few options, and most of them are pretty dark. Um, so, the backup pattern filter thing makes a degree of sense, but it's kind of a horrifying thought if you think about it. If you remember, we've already used that in this show back in Season 1 where they brought Picard back by reusing his patent data. So it's not exactly inconsistent. And that solution has also been used back in uh, the, ori or, yes, the original series as well. So that's a thing, too. But at the same time, when I look at this, all I think of is, geez, you're basically just giving your, a, a clone a scan of yourself every now and again. I mean, it's within the realm of possibility that they use the scan to change you rather than completely replace you. But you can see how that really, really gets into a gray area there. Especially given what they do at the end of the episode, which brings me to my biggest flaw in this episode by far. First, Picard insists on being the one to be at the controls to beam her aboard. Uh, why not have Data do it? Data's already proven immune to things and uh, does, it literally is not a carrier because the, the antigens that go after him find nothing because there's nothing to find. So it actually makes sense that he is literally not a carrier, truly immune to this rather than just he's a robot, so shrug. So <laughs> why, um, why doesn't Data operate the controls? Now I know why. It's so Picard could have that moment with Pulaski because this episode's really all been about the two of them and the way they kind of bounce off of each other. And I get that. But it would have made just as much sense for me to have Data there, who's already had something of a, of a bounce-off, pseudo-antagonistic, pseudo-professional relationship with her, and then have, once it's proven that it works, have Picard rush in along with O'Brien and the rest, and then embrace her. Would have made a little more sense for me. But that's not the part I really hate. The part I hate is the fact that the teleporter is frickin' magic in this episode. As I mentioned uh, last week, there, I actually have the Nitpicker's Guide. I've, I've been resisting the urge to reread through it because it really is specifically designed to nitpick these, and that's not my stated goal. But sometimes they have already done the, the work. You know, they've already done the math and actually worked out the science and matters. And the fact that this transporter can literally magically revert her to a previous state as coded within the DNA, so basically altering every strand of DNA in her entire body simultaneously... Which also fixes her hair, by the way. Do you notice that? She, it, it even it, it gives her a new do. It, <laughs> that is basically into the realm of magic at that point. And I just I look at that like I'm sorry, what? What? <laughs> now I know what you're saying. What else would you do about that? I would have killed her. Hear me out. Now, as I mentioned, I like Pulaski in this episode, and she has been growing on me more than I thought she would throughout the course of this rumination series. But remember what I've already said a few times. Push this to the end of Season 2. Maybe not the very end, but certainly on the tail end of Season 2. Uh, maybe in place of Shades of Grey. Make this episode her final episode. Imagine the different kind of series we might have gotten if Star Trek The Next Generation had killed off two regular cast members. I know that sounds like a small thing, but and, and of course, realistically looking back, that just that, that wasn't done. They didn't even plan to kill off Tasha. That happened because of real life reasons, because of having to acclimate to changes in cast and crew. That's that that type of television was not a concept at that point in time. Not really, not certainly not for this kind of a mainstream thing. That's the kind of television that's more common now. Nowadays, nobody's safe, right? But think about that. Think about this being Pulaski's swan song, her willing to lay down her life for her belief, her passion, her vision, and paying for it. And her actually staying dead, and, and the episode ending on that dark note, her, this being her way she leaves the episode. Have, the, have like the next episode or the next next episode be without a doctor and have that as a way to bring Beverly back onto the show. Now, of course, it's worth noting that none of this would have worked in real life. None of the pieces were in place to happen from a real-life perspective. But from a purely creative one, what do you think about that idea? 
because as I was watching this episode more and more, it just made more sense that it fit that way. The whole episode reads like a very grounded, small-scale, realistic, threatening character piece. I think I said realistic twice there. Very believable. It was very ground level, and I liked that. Um, Granted, all the people on the uh, Lantry died, but the scope of this was very character-driven rather than the planets are going to die. And the whole episode feels like this believable, believable medical drama along with the character stuff, and then we magic away the problem at the end. That bothered me. Even as a kid, it bothered me that they just got rid of the problem, got rid of the dilemma at the end of the episode. Now, I know, I know, I know. (laughs) But what would you think of that? Again, assuming this was shoved to the end of season two, and we, the audience, had more time to really get invested in Pulaski and see more of what she is and who she could do. Or who she is and what she could do. Ahem. One final note, really quick. There's a really nice bit right towards the end of the episode where they destroy the other ship, the the pseudo Miranda class, and um, which I keep calling the Lantry. I think it's the Lantry. Uh, I like that scene. It's very quiet. It's very somber. It's very remorse, uh, mor- moroseful. And what I like best about it is there's no orders. He just says, "Gentlemen," and everyone stands up and stands at attention. And then, there are, then they destroy it. And there are six seconds of silence, observing a moment of silence for the fallen. Again, that's kind of that believability setting building thing that I praise DS9 for. That scene was not necessary, but it did help to add to this perspective. It helped make that weight of their deaths mean a little bit more. It helped show a little bit more of the respect. It made Starfleet look more military. It... <laughs> You know, it, it added more. It's just a little sprinkling of flavoring on top of everything else, and I thought it was a good bit. <sighs> Imagine for a moment what that scene would have been like if Pulaski had, was being left behind to die, too. I have nothing else to add to this episode. I hope you've enjoyed my brief thoughts on this otherwise excellent episode. Season 2 continues to be bipolar as hell. Great episode, bad episode, great episode, bad episode, great episode, bad episode. Uh, Keeping in my new trend, I'm not looking up what's next because I don't remember the order of the episodes, but I hope to see you guys next week. Have a good one, guys.